first off, what we have is from Yifan. So Yifan, can you share your screen, please? Yeah, uh, yeah, so let oh, me right. see how to share my screen. So Yifan is going to talk about currently output delivery comes free in honest majority MPC. It's a joint work with Vipul Goyal uh, and Sensing Yu. So once you're ready, Yifan, go ahead. Yeah, okay. So uh, can I see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So hello everyone. Uh, my name is uh, my name is Yifan Sang. Today I'm honored to give a talk about our recent work, guaranteed output delivery comes free in honest majority MPC, co-authored with Vipo Goya and Chen Zhu. Multi-party computation allows several mutually distrusted parties to evaluate the function on their private inputs. It guarantees that the product or execution does not leak anything about their individual inputs beyond what can be inferred from the function output. Usually the functionality is represented as a circuit, and here we choose to use an arithmetic circuit or a finite field. The circuit supports uh, addition and the multiplication operations. In this work, we are interested in an majority setting, assuming broadcast channel and the peer-to-peer -peer private channels. Our goal is to construct an unconditionally secure MPC protocol with guaranteed output delivery. There are several benefits of unconditional MPC. Um, a key feature is that we do not need any expensive cryptographic primitives such as public key encryption or obvious transfer and the protocol is secure unconditionally. Compared with protocols in the computational setting, a major benefit is that we do not need any complicated and time-consuming local computation. And it is possible to achieve fairness and guaranteed output delivery in this setting. Therefore, the most efficient MPC protocols are in the unconditional MPC paradigm. Since local computations are typically simple, often just a series of linear operations, the efficiency of a protocol in the real world is dominated by its communication complexity. There are two types of adulteries. One type is semi-honest adultery, and the other one is fully malicious adultery. In general, to achieve malicious security, we need to compile a semi-honest protocol using additional tools. For example, GMW compiler in the computational setting and the verifiable security sharing in the unconditional setting. Apparently, achieving malicious security is more difficult than semi-honest security. Therefore, we ask the following question. Is it necessary to pay for malicious security? In this work, we basically show that we can achieve the same efficiency as the best known semi-ice protocol in this setting. Here is the comparison of recent works of com communication efficient MVC protocols in the honest majority setting. In the semi on setting, the best known protocol is the DIM protocol, which requires six elements for party per gate. This can be viewed as a baseline for communication complexity. Recently, there are two works, CGH plus 18 and NV18, both achieving 12 elements for party per gate in the setting of security with a board. In this work, we give the first construction where the communication complexity matches the best known uh, DN semi protocol. We, further, we make a further improvement to reduce the cost from six elements to 5.5 elements. In the setting of guaranteed output delivery, previously best known works have bad dependencies on either the circuit depth or the circuit width. In BSF012, it has the term order of D times N square, where D is the circuit depth and N is the number of parties. In IKP plus 16, it has the term order of W times poly N, where W is the circuit width. Both protocols will suffer when either the circuit depth is very large or the circuit width is very large. In this work, we gave the first construction where the communication complexity is linear in the circuit size. Concretely, we achieve 5.5 elements per party per gate in the best case, and 7.5 elements when one or more corrupted parties abort. 
our starting point uh, is the observation in GIP plus 14 that the DIM protocol is secure up to an additive attack. This allows us to only verify modifications to achieve security with the bot. We rely on the techniques in BBCG plus 19, which allows us to get a sublinear cost for modification verification. Compared with the techniques in BBCG plus 19, we extend the use of it to the end party setting, make it more suitable for more multi party computation, and also explore recursion to further improve the efficiency. To obtain guaranteed auto delivery, we use this dispute control, a general strategy to uh, achieve full security efficiently. However, this strategy itself is not sufficient. We rely on virtual transcript to identify credit parties, small surgery to let the, pro uh, the protocol proceed when one or more credit parties are bought, and the verifiable security sharing to establish checkpoints so that we do not need to uh, start from the beginning if the computation fails. Here is uh, an experiment result um, of our secure with the bot protocol compared with the previously best known implementation result, the work by Cheetah and others in 2018. This shows that our protocol is also efficient in practice. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Yifan. So if you have any questions, please type them here on the chat or on Julie. So I don't see any questions so far, but we can wait a bit. So I want to ask you, can you please uh, say a few words about the recursion? Uh, yeah, so uh, basically, uh, uh, so say we have n modifications, and uh, our idea is to reduce the uh, number of modifications by a factor of k each time, so that if you repeat these this steps for say log m times, you will get only one modification in the end. And our goal is just uh, to repeat the steps, and finally you can just check one modification in the end. And the, the main point here is that we show that each uh, each step you only need to pay the cost linear in the in this k instead and is independent of m. So if you follow these steps, the communication cost will be just the k times log m. And the, uh, actually in our experiment, we show we, we note that usually we need just a small k to achieve the better efficiency. That means you need to repeat this uh, more times, but each time you will just uh, reduce the number of the modifications by a small factor. So in the experiments, what was the number k that you were using? The ones that uh, you Yeah, I guess it is about 10 or 11. Okay, so uh, we have actually two more questions. So the other one is from Amit. Can you explain a bit about dispute control? Yeah, so the idea of dispute control is you, can, you need to divide the circuit into several small segments. And uh, now you are going to run out the, those segments uh, one by one in sequence. And the idea is that if, you, if your computation fails at some segment, you just need to recompute the current segment and you do not need to say, go back from the beginning. So if you cut the circuit into uh, say uh, n parts and you can make sure you make sure that each failure you will identify at least one credit parties, then basically you just pay one times of the computation. Thank you. Then we have one more question. Karim is asking uh, if you can, if you can uh, actually, does your scheme work for rings? For rings? Oh my God. Sorry, can I repeat the question? Maybe I can ask it. Directly. I can, oh. Yes, okay. right. go ahead, Karim. Yeah, there was a recently, I mean, paper which is maybe not public yet, but it was presented in Arahus MPC uh, workshop, and basically they achieve quite similar goal to full security, but they were, I mean, claiming that we achieve 1.5 for each uh, multiplication gate. So have you seen their presentation or are you aware of that paper? Uh, 
not yet. So, but I guess uh, if you want to achieve 1.5 elements, basically you are in the setting, you're in the computational setting. So you need to use them um, uh, like PR, uh, PRG or one way function. But so in, in this work, we are interested in the unconditional MPC. So I guess okay. this is maybe one gap. Yeah, mm -hmm. and also for 1.5, uh, I know one work, uh, I'm not sure whether that is uh, what you mentioned, but that is not worked for uh, any number of parties. So it requires a number of parties to be constrained to a constant. Yes, true. Their, their construction is for fixed, but uh, yeah, yours is for arbitrary number of parties, yeah? Yeah, this is for arbitrary number of parties. Okay, yes, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Yifan. We're uh, right on time. So if you have okay. more questions, you can paste them on the chat for Yifan or email him personally or paste them on Zulip. So let's move to the next talk. So Baralon, can you uh, share your screen? Yes, do you see the screen? Yes, great. So the next talk, title MPC with friends and foes is by Baralon on Omri Iran, Anad Paskin Tunyaski, and Barry is going to give the talk. Okay, so thank you. And today I'm going to talk about MPC with friends and foes. This is joint work with Iran Omri and Anad Paskin Tunyaski. So I'm going to start with an example uh, about secure election. So let's say that we have three parties. Each of them is chosen between two candidates. And let's say that they are going uh, that the parties know somehow that at most one of them is corrupted. Most one of them can be malicious. And somehow they figured out that the second party is being malicious. So using this knowledge, the other two parties, the first and the third party, what they do in this weird protocol is that they exchange their inputs. And now they can locally compute who the winner is. However, now there's a problem because the third party can actually realize who the first party voted for, which is very problematic. No, none of us actually want to reveal who we voted for because later on this could lead to stuff like violence. And this is actually something that is general in secure multi-party computation. We can, do, we can construct such protocol and they will be considered secure. And the reason is that because when we define security, we only care about the view of the adversary. We put no restrictions on the view of the uh, parties, of the honest parties. So they can always exchange their inputs. So you might say, okay, uh, this is allowed, but no one actually constructs a protocol. However, there are in fact uh, protocols out there that uh, use this. And uh, one example is the Turan protocol of Isha et al. Uh, well, that uh, utilizes this fact that th this kind of protocol is secure in order to minimize the run complexity uh, required to do the computation. Okay, so let's say that we don't actually use this type of protocols and let's say we only want to consider uh, standard protocols. Let's say even GMW or BGW where the, the parties start with uh, sharing their inputs. But even then, there's, there are other problems because let's say that they are using GMW and they will share their inputs. In this case, the adversary can simply reveal its share to the other honest parties. And in this case, the honest parties, let's say that the third one received uh, two shares. Now he has enough information in order to reconstruct X1 again. And again, this would lead to violence later on. So in this uh, research, we tackle this question and uh, we wanted to figure out whether we can extend the classical notion of security to also prevent leakage of uh, honest, honest parties information to other honest parties and perhaps even co colluding subsets of honest parties. So uh, a naive way to try and solve this problem is to simply take a protocol that can handle more malicious uh, parties that is more secure in this sense. And I claim that this won't do. And why is that? So first, uh, we lose efficiency. Uh, we want to deal with more co-opted parties. We might, uh, the protocol might be, uh, take a longer time to run. Second, uh, if we want to keep uh, stuff like guaranteed output delivery, then this might render the problem uh, completely impossible. And uh, as an example, in the paper we showed that uh, free party coin tossing can actually be computed with one malicious party and one semi-honest party, assuming that they are not colluding. And obviously, it is already known that assuming that they are colluding, we cannot compute the three-party coin tossing. 
And finally, uh, malicious security doesn't always uh, actually imply the desired uh, security that we want to. And even though it's a very strong security notion, the intuitive reason behind this is that even though we're dealing with a stronger adversary than what we want, their simulator is also stronger. So it will be problematic to, uh, to use it in order to construct the weaker simulator that we need. So to solve all, the, all of these issues, we introduced a new security notion, which we call security with friends and foes, or FAF security for short. And roughly TH star FAF security requires the following. So let's say again that we have three parties. So first we require that for any adversary, malicious adversary corrupting at most key parties, and in this example, let's say that it corrupted the, the bottom left one. We want to say that the, we can simulate it in some ideal world, just like in the standard definition. Additionally, for any semi-honest adversary corrupting at most eight star of the parties, let's say that it's the bottom right one, we want to claim that uh, we can also simulate it in that same ideal world uh, while interacting with the adversary, however, not colluding with the adversary. So it's a different entity. And furthermore, we require that this condition to hold even if the adversary sends non-prescribed messages to the semi-honest party, and it can even do so after the interaction and all over the end. And finally, in order to claim that this actually works, uh, that this actually uh, has the intuitive uh, notion that we want to, that no honest parties reveal any information to other honest parties, we require that also the other honest parties are also simulatable in that ideal world. And finally, we also give some uh, few results about this new notion. And let me tell you a bit about two of them. So the first theorem is about characterization. We show that any multi-party functionality can be computed with TH star for security, if and only if 2T plus H star is strictly smaller than the number of parties. And the second uh, result we have is about uh, run complexity. And we show that uh, assuming pseudo-random generators, we can compute any uh, functionality in just three rounds with one one for security. And in fact, we can even increase this threshold. However, for two rounds, this is already impossible, which gives some evidence as to why in the two round protocol of Isha et al that I mentioned earlier, the honest parties had to reveal some information to other honest parties. And that's it, thank you. Thanks a lot, Bar. So please ask your questions, if you have any. May I ask why you require one-way permutations in the, in the first theorem? Uh, uh, we wanted one-way permutation. Uh, it was uh, some technicality. We wanted to make sure that uh, in the functionality uh, that the simulator, if the malicious simulator changes its input, then the product, then the output of the parties uh, will be bot, will be bottom. So if we use one word permutation, that uh, that makes things a lot easier. Okay, so it's a technical thing to prove. Thank we you. have a question in the chat. Yeah, somebody is asking in a strong FAF security, the malicious party sends its view to the semi-honest party. In that case, how is it strong FAF different from the collusion of the malicious parties plus uh, eight semi-honest parties? So if I understand correctly, the, the, you asked about the difference between an adversary that corrupts a, malicious, a subset maliciously and the subset semi-honestly and the, the strong for security notion, where we require to simulate the view of the adversary and the view of the semi-honest parties together. The, re, the main difference is that in the FAF security, the adversary doesn't have the view of the semi-honest parties. It can only uh, attack based on his uh, own view without the additional H star parties. Okay, thanks. That question was from Pratik. So I don't see any other question. Let me check Zuri chat. I don't see any questions in the Zuri chat. Okay, thanks a lot, Bar. Whoever has more questions, please uh, reach out to Bar. So let's move to the next talk. Uh, Min Kwok, can you share your screen? Actually, can you please uh, pronounce your name? Oh, uh, sure, Min Yuan. Yes. Min Yuan, okay, thank you. Uh, can you see my slides? 
Yes. Okay. So the next talk is about black box use of one-way functions is useless for optimal fire coin tossing by Hemantha Manzi and Mingwa Wang. And Mingwa is giving the talk. Please okay. go ahead. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ming Yuan. Today, I'm happy to present our work, Black Box Use of One-Way Functions is Useless for Optimal Fair Coin Tossing. This is a joint work with my advisor, Hamata Maji. So in this work, we studied two-party fair coin tossing protocols. We have Alice and Bob, who will exchange a total number of R messages. And at the end of the protocol, they will always agree on the output. So fair computation requires that even if one party aborts during the execution, the other party should still output a bit. Consequently, every party maintains a defense coin, which will be their output if the other party aborts. The insecurity of such protocols is defined as how much an adversary can change the expected output of the other party. So let me summarize the known results first. Firstly, in the information theoretic setting, or if one function do not exist, we know that in the presence of malicious adversary, every protocol is constantly insecure. On the other hand, if we only consider fair stop adversary, then any protocol is one over square root of our insecure. Next, if we assume the existence of one-way functions, then we have explicit protocols that achieves one over square root of our insecurity. Finally, if one assumes the stronger assumption that oblivious transfer exists, then by the beautiful work of Moran, Nao, and Sagiv, they construct a protocol that is one over R insecure. Note that Cleave shows that the one over R insecurity is inevitable. Therefore, the MNS protocol is optimal fair. Given these results, it's natural to ask whether we can construct optimal fair coin tossing based on one-way functions alone. So in this work, we answer this question partially by showing that any black box construction of a fair coin tossing protocol from one-way functions is at least one over square root of R insecure. So this results implies that the protocols from the 1980s are actually the best protocol one can build that use one-way functions in a black box manner. Our proof extends the re uh, recently introduced potential based argument to the information theoretic random oracle setting. Let me mention that our hardness of computation results holds even for the weaker game-based security definition, and it extends naturally to any multi-party functionality, as long as the output has entropy and the honest parties are not in the majority. So follow the paradigm initiated by Impagliazzo and Rudic, we consider fair coin tossing in the information theoretic random oracle model. Here, Alice and Bob have unbounded computational power, and lambda is the security parameter. There have been two works that study this problem. In a work by Dachman, Solad, Lindell, Mohamed, and Malkin, they show that if the message complexity is small, then an attacker can ask sub-exponential many queries and impose one over square root of R insecurity. In another work, they, uh, Dachman, Solad, Mohamed, and Malkin, study a restricted type of protocol that they call function oblivious. For such protocols, they show that an attacker can ask polynomially many queries and impose insecurity higher than one over R. So in comparison, our work assume no restriction on the protocol and uh, we show an attacker that asks polynomially many queries and achieves one over square root of R insecurity. Let me mention two additional works that is relevant to us. In the work by Hatna, Omri, and Zaurism, they show that random oracle is useless for inputless two-party functionality against the Simon honest adversary. However, note that prematurely abort is not an semi honest behavior. In another work by Hatna, Makroyanis, and Omri, they prove that uh, for any constant R, the existence of a R message fair coin tossing protocol that achieves insecurity lower than inverse of square root of R implies the existence of key agreement protocols. This, per, this their work is incomparable to ours as they prove a stronger consequence, but for a restricted class of protocols. Finally, let me give you a very brief overview of our proof. So we, we inductively prove that 
there exists a universal constant C such that for any fair coin tossing protocol with expected output X is at least this much insecure. So our inductive uh, step proceeds as follows. For any first message tau, we consider whether Alice and Bob attack this first message right now, or do they defer their attack to the remaining R minus one message protocol? By the inductive hypothesis, we know that if they defer their attack, they can at least achieve this much insecurity. In a recent work by Horace Ghani, Maji, and Wang, we propose this potential function and show that the optimal attack can at least achieve insecurity lower bounded by this potential function. So it remains to prove that averaging over all the first message, our potential function is higher than our objective. To prove this, we prove a Jensen's inequality for our potential function. Let me emphasize that this potential function is actually not a convex function. Yet KMW showed that when X, A, and B are sampled from an information theoretic communication protocol, then Jensen's inequality does hold. In this work, we show that in the random oracle model, an attacker can ask polynomially many additional queries to ensure a global inva invariant holds. And we prove that this constraint is sufficiently strong to ensure Jensen's inequality holds. And this completes our proof. So I will refer you to our paper for more details on the proof. And with that, I will end my talk. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Oh, sorry, I accidentally stopped sharing. Oh, it's fine. Let's wait to see if there's any question. Uh, Lara, you are looking. Oh, okay. So. I didn't see any questions on Zulip. I'm checking again. Okay. Thanks a lot. That was great. And whoever is interested can watch actually the full videos online. Thank you. I think we can move to the next talk. Next talk. Yes. So the next talk should be Suzumo. Suzumo, can you share your screen? All right. So the next talk is Suzumo Kiyoshima. is talking about round optimal black box commit and proof with succinct communication. So go ahead, Suzumo. Okay. Uh, can you see my slide, right? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Thank you. So hello everyone, I'm Susumu Kiyoshima from NTT Research. So as the title of this work suggests, uh, in this work, uh, we study succinct committant pool protocols, and in particular, we obtain a new committant pool protocol by using a two-round succinct argument. And uh, in order to explain the motivation behind this result, uh, let me first explain what two-round succinct argument is. So what is a two-round succinct argument? It is a two-party protocol between a proof of P and the verifier V, where the protocol consists of just two messages, and the prover try to convince the verifier of the correctness of a statement. And as usual, a uh, succinct argument are required to satisfy completeness and soundness. And additionally, uh, as an efficiency requirement, uh, succinct argument are required to satisfy succinctness, uh, which requires that the communication complexity is very small. Uh, such as a polylog of t, where t is the time needed for checking whether the statement is true or not. And in this work, uh, we focus on a two-round succinct argument based on falsifier assumption. And in particular, we focus on the scheme by Karaylas Rosegram and subsequent works. So from now, whenever I say succinct argument, I always mean these schemes. So these schemes, these succinct arguments uh, have uh, several nice properties and such as uh, they can be proven sound under standard assumption like uh, learning with error. And also they can be used to prove any statement in P or even some statement in MP. So essentially what I want to say here is that uh, we already have a really, really good result on two round succinct argument based on falsifiable, uh, falsifiable assumptions. Then uh, given this uh, state of the art, a uh, natural question to ask is uh, whether we can obtain other succinct protocol by using a two-round succinct argument. 
So unfortunately, unfortunately uh, doing so is uh, actually not trivial since uh, the existing two long succession argument are less powerful in several aspects when they are compared with typical non succinct argument in cryptography. So for example, one of the weakness of the existing two long succession argument is that the current soundness for all LP is not guaranteed, meaning that the soundness is known to hold only for some subclasses of M some, some, some subclasses of MT statement. And indeed, because of uh, this difficulty, uh, even though currently we have a uh, several applications, uh, the number of applications is still limited. So one of the motivation of this work is to study whether there exists any other application of two-round succinct argument to other succinct protocols. Then, uh, uh, as I said at the beginning, in this work, we study uh, application to commitment pool protocols, and in particular, we obtain uh, succinct commitment pool protocols. So what is a commitment pool protocol? A commitment pool protocol is uh, basically a commitment scheme that has an uh, additional proof property. So in particular, uh, in the commit phase, uh, the prover can commit to its secret input uh, just as in standard commitment scheme. And later in the additional proof phase, the prover can prove any statement on the committed values uh, without opening the commitment. And the most famous application of commit and protocol is a black box compiler from semi-on security to malicious security. And uh, our succinct commit and protocol certifies the following properties. So first, uh, our basic scheme certify witness indistinguishability and the constant sound error. And it can be upgraded into a scheme with uh, zero knowledge and the negligent sound error uh, by using uh, existing transformation. And second, uh, our commitment pool protocol has only four rounds. And after the transformation into zero knowledge and negligent sound error, uh, this round of complexity is optimal uh, when our commitment pool protocol is viewed as a black box zero knowledge argument. And third, uh, our commitment pool protocol only requires a relatively mild assumption. And finally, our commitment pool protocol is black box in the sense that uh, it uses uh, underlying cryptographic primitive only a black box way. So previously, there existed a black box construction of commit and pull protocols that are either round optimal or succinct under standard assumption, uh, but our protocol is the first one that satisfies both of them simultaneously. And of course, I don't have time to explain our technique, uh, but uh, if, you, if you really, really would like to know the technique, a very high level overview is, is given in this slide, so you can read it by yourself. Uh, so this is the end of this talk, so thank you very much. Thank you very much for your talk. So if there, is a, there are any questions, please post them on the chat or on the Zulip. I'm checking both of them. So can I ask by voice here? Yes, go ahead, Karim. So okay. once you say that you have a succinct uh, proof, so basically you don't consider the commit phase, yeah? Do you consider what? Do Okay, do you have also succinct commitments or your- uh, Yeah, 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 yeah. I, already con I also consider succinct commitments. So both okay, so uh, how... commit phase and the proof phase has a succinct communication. Both of them are succinct, yeah? Oh, oh. I mean, commitment and also proof. Both of yeah, them yeah. are succinct. So yeah. how you achieve this property by falsifiable assumptions, there was on this impossibility result from 2011 that you cannot have Succinct proofs under a standard assumption. Let's see. Uh, yeah, yeah. Assumption. So, so yeah, that that uh, that impossibility result has uh, some uh, you know additional require some uh, hold on succinct argument based on more stronger uh, some strong property such as uh, such as uh, for example in this in our protocol and uh, as a as a start succinct protocol based on forty five function, uh, the pro the sound is for only for you know designated verifier, meaning that uh, the verifier uh, is allowed to have a secret input and uh, a secret uh, information. But rather in that impossibility result, uh, sound is, uh, I think as far as I know, sound is for on I required to hold for you know uh, public uh, for any verifier. So meaning that the CRS doesn't have any security information. And do you have post quantum security here as well? Because MPC in the head was no or yes? Well, I haven't 
consider anything about post quantum security? Uh, I mean, because MPC in the head was based on one way functions, basically, it was supposed to be secure. So I was just curious about the second part that you have added. Well, it's natural to think that if you know the underlying assumption are post quantum secure, then the whole scheme is also post quantum secure. But uh, you know, since I haven't consider anything about that, so I, I cannot say. Okay, yet. thanks. I will check the full version. Thank you. Thanks, Karim. Uh, I don't see any other question in the chat. So I would like to thank Suzumu again, and we All can right. maybe move to the other talk. If there are any other questions, please post them on Zulip, and the conversation will continue after this session. So I think the next talk is given by Kastern. Kastern, can you share your screen? Yep, here it should be. Yes. So the next talk is Efficient Constant Round MPC with Identifiable Abort and Public Verifiability. The talk is going to be given by Caster Baum, and the work is in collaboration with Emanuela Orsini, Peter Scholl, and Eduardo Soria Vasquez. Go ahead, Caster. OK, uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, yeah. Uh, as, uh, as, as mentioned in the introduction, I'm going to talk about uh, some certain uh, style of constant round uh, MPC. Um, and this is joint work uh, with uh, Emanuela from Kau Leuven and uh, Peter and Eduardo Vujic also at uh, Aarhus University. So the first question is, what is MPC? But I guess we can skip that because this is the MPC session. I don't have enough time for that. But the second question is, what is fairness in MPC? So uh, fairness in MPC means that if you have an adversary that uh, gets the output in a secure computation, then the honest parties get uh, the output as well. So this seems to be like a very, very straightforward property that you should you know, always have. But actually in uh, 1986 already Cleave proved that um, this uh, property of fairness is impossible to achieve if you have a dishonest majority. Meaning that if you, for example, in particular in a two-party setting, uh, then you can never have a protocol that is fair uh, and, and secure. So um, what does it mean? Why is this a problem? So let's assume we have an uh, application where we uh, use a secure computation, for example, for an auction, right? So let's say we run an auction and then, uh, you know, like the auction says that uh, one of the honest parties actually won with its bid and only the adversary gets the output. Well, the best thing you could do now is to rerun the auction and the adversary could now, for example, readjust its input. So this is just one of the, one of the examples of cases why you actually want to have fairness in MPC. There's also uh, plenty of other cases for that. So instead, let's uh, look at a different property, uh, which is normally called identifiable abort. Uh, so what is the difference between, uh, let's say, a, a unfair protocol and a protocol with identifiable abort. Um, in an unfair protocol and the, the protocol with identifiable abort, so in a normal protocol execution, you would have the same that, you know, if everything works nicely, then all the parties uh, get the output. The difference lies in what happens when the dishonest party, uh, when the adversary cheats. So uh, in the unfair protocol, as said before, uh, honest parties uh, walk away without anything. But if the adversary cheats in a protocol with identifiable abort, then the honest parties at least see one of the parties that have been cheating. So they can identify one of the adversary, the controlled parties. And if you rerun the protocol, you can, for example, exclude that party uh, to, if, you, if, you, if you run it again. So this seems to be a property that is uh, desirable and is strictly stronger than uh, you know, just having a non-fair protocol. And uh, it has been shown already in 2014 by Ishai et al. that you can have this identifiable abort property even uh, if you have a dissonance majority. So our, our contributions in our work is uh, we present an actively secure MPC protocol which has this identifiable abort property and it runs in a constant number of rounds, which is an improvement above uh, previous works, uh, which uh, were efficient protocols that were known had to run uh, in a uh, number of rounds that is uh, proportional to the depth of the circuit. Our protocol is proven UC secure against any static adversary controlling a dishonest majority. And uh, we achieve our construction by uh, altering an existing uh, highly efficient MPC protocol that has a constant number of rounds, but it doesn't have identifiable abort. 
and we show in our work that although, although it's not implemented yet that it has a reasonable overhead over this existing construction and we also show uh, as already mentioned in the title that we can have a public verifiability property of the output which means that if you allow yourself to have a bulletin board present during the computation then you can uh, show to a third party either that the output of the com computation is correct or you could show to a third party that was not participating in the computation that a certain party had cheated. So you have a publicly verifiable proof that a party has cheated, which could be you know, helpful in uh, certain applications. So for the technical uh, core ideas, uh, I'll, I'll just uh, try to quickly mention them. So we modify an existing highly efficient uh, constant round MPC protocol due to Hazai et al which is based on the so-called BMR paradigm. So what you do in BMR is that you have an offline phase where you preprocess a garbling of a circuit and in the online phase, you evaluate that garbled circuit, albeit in a multi-party setting. And our adaption to the online phase is that we, uh, you know, we see that if an error happens in the online phase, it means the gate was garbled wrongly. We then recompute this specific gate to identify the cheater in order to, uh, to you know, to so we, we, we use data that is available from the offline phase uh, from commitments to just redo this gobbling step. And if it leads us to the same output, then we can, uh, you know, shoot the party that claimed that there was an error. Otherwise, we can identify a cheater. And we also need to make the offline phase uh, identifiable as well, um, where we rely on a, a previous compiler due to Ishai et al, but we uh, improve their construction, um, meaning that we don't have to rely on adaptively secure uh, primitives. And we also alter the existing BMR uh, preprocessing to output these commitments to the gobbling material that we need in order to identify uh, cheaters in the online phase later. And uh, yeah, as uh, mentioned, this is only a very, very high level overview, obviously due to the lack of time. So if you have uh, any interest in more details, uh, first of all, obviously there's the video available, but then also I'd like to refer you to uh, our paper on ePrint. And with this, uh, I'd like to conclude my short talk. Thanks, Kathleen. Uh, again, if there are any questions, you can post them on the chat or on the Zulip. and I might have a, a very quick question. So you talk about reasonable timings uh, compared to the previous solution, which had not the identifiable abort. Yeah. Uh, so you said you you didn't implement the, the the solution, but do you have a rough estimate or a rough idea on how reasonable would be this uh, overhead? Um, I can uh, like right now only <laughs> quickly skim through all the slides in order to identify uh, the right one that has the overview, but that is going to take forever. Uh, so basically, uh, we have to do a bit more uh, of broadcast, uh, and broadcast is kind of inherent if you want to identify cheaters because you have to mm -hmm. show that somebody didn't send the message. But we actually don't have to do, uh, we, we can have an optimistic setting with not too much broadcast. And uh, in addition, we have to generate these commitments, um, but so we get an order of N uh, overhead over the uh, existing construction, uh, but we seem to be on par with all other constructions uh, for MPC with identifiable abort that have the same asymptotic complexity when you look at the number of parties. Thank you very much. Oh, I have a question in the chat by Vasilis. Uh, he asks, does an IOZ compiler instantiated with a constant round semi-honest protocol yield a constant round protocol with identifiable abort? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so as, as I mentioned, uh, so, so, so our construction uh, is, um, so th this construction, first of all, wouldn't be black box in the, uh, in the actual protocol because you would have to run the zero knowledge proofs of the IOZ compiler in the online phase to show that um, uh, all the parties behave correctly. And then the IOZ compiler itself would need adaptive uh, primitives in the offline phase. So actually we don't need any zero knowledge proofs uh, in our protocol. So we basically run the same gobbling phase as an existing BMR protocol. And we have some additional commitments on top um, and that you we don't need to 
prove in every round of the protocol that we have behaved correctly to every other party. And it also holds for the, um, if you want to make a protocol, for example, publicly verifiable, uh, then you could, instead of the IOZ compiler, you could uh, take the compiler by KIS at all, but then you would have to prove with NISX in every round that you follow the protocol correctly, whereas uh, our protocol doesn't need any uh, such NISX. Um, I can't hear you, Ilaria, because you're still muted. I'm sorry, I forgot. Uh, I was saying I have another question in the chat by Pratik. He asks, um, can the multiplicative N overhead be reduced in a mortise sense for multiple runs of the same function? Could possibly, we haven't thought of that, I have to admit. But good idea, like maybe worthwhile looking into that, yes. Okay, I think we can wrap it up here. Uh, Thanks a lot, Castor, and thanks everyone for the questions. If there are any other questions for Castor, please post them on Zulip, and I think we can move to the next uh, uh, talk. There is an appreciation for Castor background, by the way, in the chat. Uh, so next talk is by Mark. Mark, can you share your screen? Yep. Okay, can so yes, I can see, we can see it. So the next talk is going to be black box uh, transformations from passive to covert, uh, covert security with public verifiability. The work is by Ivan Damgard, Claudio Orlandi, and Mark Sinking, and Mark is going to give the talk. So go ahead, Mark. Cool. OK, uh, thank you for the introduction. So as all of the previous talks, we talk about MPC, where we have some parties. They have some inputs. They talk to each other, and they produce some outputs, which shouldn't be their inputs. Um, and um, one thing that I would like to do is to review usually the threat models that we usually consider. So what we consider most of the time is a passive adversary, which follows the protocol description honestly and doesn't, miss, doesn't deviate from the protocol, but tries to learn some more than he's supposed to learn by looking at the messages that uh, it receives. And we know how to construct quite efficient protocols against, that are secure against such adversaries. But unfortunately, this security notion tends to be too weak for practical applications where you do actually want to prevent an adversary that deviates from the protocol description. So instead, what we do is we look also at the active adversaries, which can misbehave in an arbitrary fashion. So can they, they can deviate from the protocol. They can abort when they don't like something. And we also have protocols that satisfy this security notion. But unfortunately, this strong security notion comes at a price, and the protocols that we have are quite a bit slower than the passively secure counterparts. So this was already observed by Oman and Lindell in 2007, where they introduced a notion which is basically in between passive and active security, which they called covert security. And the idea here is to still consider an adversary that can deviate from the protocol description in an arbitrary fashion. Um, but now we would only require that this misbehavior is detected with some constant probability. So for example, with some probability of one half, we will detect this misbehavior and for example, abort the protocol and with a probability of one half, the adversary will be successful and can actually cheat in the protocol execution. And the goal here is to like construct faster protocols and also obtain some security notion that is somewhat better than security against passive adversaries. And uh, the rationale behind this notion was that in certain applications, the repercussions from being caught misbehaving are so large that the adversary is already disincentivized from doing this. So for example, if the party is a big company and it will lose its reputation, then maybe this party doesn't want to cheat if it's going to be caught with a constant probability. And uh, then in 2012, Asharov and Orlandi observed that Covert security by itself may be a little bit too weak. So what we really would like is to have kind of still this guarantee that we detect cheating with a constant probability. But additionally, we would like to have um, the guarantee that if the honest parties detect the misbehavior, then they obtain some form of certificate, which they can use to prove to a third party that this cheating indeed happened. So as a toy example, you can imagine that you have some form of a smart contract on a blockchain or something, and like uh, using this proof, you can go and um, steal the deposit of the misbehaving party uh, if cheating uh, occurred. So what do we know about these types of protocols? Well, for covert security, we basically know how to 
to garbled circuits and how to do the multi-party version of garbled circuits called BMR um, with better efficiency than their actively secure versions if we only require covert security. And we also know how to do efficient pre-processing for speeds, which given that the speeds online phase is actively secure, gives you an overall protocol that is currently secure. And um, we also know how to take an arbitrary passively secure, well, not an arbitrary, like a secret sharing based passively secure protocol that is secure in the honest majority setting and compile it into a covertly secure protocol. For covert security with public verifiability, we basically know how to do efficient garbled circuits and nothing else. So what we asked in this paper is, can we construct, um, can we generically take a passively secure protocol and convert it into a protocol that is covertly secure and publicly verifiable? And we answered this question in the positive for mostly the 2PC case. So what we do is we present a compiler that takes a passively secure protocol and uses oblivious transfer in a black box fashion to construct protocols that are covertly secure and publicly verifiable. And uh, we do this basically in two steps. So first we do a compiler that works for passively secure protocols that take no inputs. And uh, then we use this compiler to construct another compiler that uh, works for arbitrary protocols where the parties do actually have uh, private inputs. And here it should be mentioned that at first it may seem like a compiler for protocols with no inputs is useless, but such protocols are actually very useful for setting up correlated randomness. So using just this first result, we already obtain the most efficient two-party speeds protocol with covert security and public verifiability. And like without going into the details, just to give like a very, very rough idea of what we do is uh, we have two parties and they have their private input. And what they will do is they will imagine parties in their heads. So this goes somewhat in the direction of like the IPS compiler or MPC in the head kind of techniques. So they imagine some virtual parties and they will secret share their inputs uh, among their virtual parties that they will simulate. So when these virtual parties then run a passively secure protocol, Alice and Bob will basically act on behalf of those virtual parties in some appropriate fashion. And because the protocol is only passively secure, like one of the virtual parties might send, might send a malicious message which affects the output of, in this case, Bob. So this is kind of like what we need to prevent in the way we simulate those virtual parties. So very roughly what we do is we let the parties check some random subset of these uh, virtual parties and uh, check that they behave honestly. So what we mean by that is we basically see the random tape that they use, the input, and the messages that come in and go out of that party. And if, for example, Bob has these informations, then he can recompute the messages that that virtual party is supposed to send and check whether they're honest. Um, so now if a virtual party sends a message to another virtual party, we basically let the um, real parties send this message on their behalf and in addition, sign the message. So very, very roughly the intuition is that if now Alice misbehaves, then she has sent a message with a signature which is not consistent with uh, the random tape and the private input that she has. And then Bob can use this information to show to a third party that Alice cheated. So yes, um, yeah, so all messages are signed uh, and it kind of works because Bob secretly checks one of the virtual parties so Alice doesn't know which one. And then cheating is basically caught with a probability which is the number of check parties uh, time divided by the number of simulated parties by Alice. Um, so obviously this like skips a lot of details. So for example, uh, you can check out the paper for how to compile protocols with no inputs. There are actually quite a, a few subtleties to take care of to make this intuition of the compiler work. And uh, also it's somewhat non-trivial to achieve public verifiability in a black box manner. So here the important part is that we want to provide a certificate to third party, but the certificate should ideally not reveal the private inputs of the honest parties. So this kind of puts some obstacles in our way. Uh, thank you for your attention and I welcome you to read the paper for the details. Thanks, Mark. If there are any questions, please post them in the chat or on Zulip. Uh, we have a question, comment by Nigel mm -hmm. for Mark on Zulip. Uh, Mark comment, not a question, the traditional covert pre-processing for speeds is now probably slower than the actively secure pre-processing, by the way. Uh, sure, but like, I, I mean, I didn't check these things in detail um, for this paper, but um, presumably you can take the most up-to-date uh, 
passively secure protocol and then compile it into a covertly secure one. And we basically show how to take the most up-to-date passively secure protocol and compile it into a covert security with public verifiability. Any other questions on Zulipor? Uh, we have a few more minutes, if there are any other. In the meantime, may I ask you if your solution is implemented already? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. So, um, so the, the speeds thing, could, like, I think, is actually like provides the most efficient speeds uh, two-party version with this flavor of security. Mm -hmm. um, for the general case, one had like one would need to check whether this beats like um, customized customized state-of-the-art solutions. So it's like much, it's better asymptotically than, um, for example, compilers that produce actively secure protocols. But we didn't spend a lot of time to check whether it is also better than, let's say, the most practical garbled circuit-based uh, protocol. Mm -hmm. When, when you say general case, you mean multi-party case, not only two-party? Oh, I, I mean, um, like, like you make black, like for an arbitrary two-party protocol. Oh, like okay. we have some extensions for multi-party. For multi-party. Yeah, yeah. I mean, general case, I mean, an arbitrary passively secure protocol. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Uh, I don't see any other questions on Zulip or on the chat. And uh, we are in time, I think. I think we can wrap up. Thank you. Session. Uh, Antigone, do you have um, any comments? No, thanks uh, to all the speakers and all the participants. And please join the RAM session. It is coming soon. The RAM session will be a new Zoom link. Uh, this room room is going to disappear. Follow on in the program in 15 minutes, and we'll see you there. Bring your strawberries. Indeed. Thanks, everyone.